all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Welcome to the Essential Bible Studies Podcast. My name is Jay Mayock. And my name is Tim Young. Jay, we're here with our second part of our study on the inspiration of God. If you haven't listened to the first one, I would suggest you go back and listen to the first one, how God spoke through his angels and through his prophets. To me, the scripture is just very clear how God is behind all of the words that were spoken by the prophets. They weren't their own words. They weren't imagining these things. God spoke directly to them. So I was really encouraged by that that study because you can really feel how powerfully the scripture is the word of God. And so two thumbs up for that that discussion, yeah. that podcast with you. That was very helpful to see and to see as well how it was that the writers of the scripture itself wrote with such confidence, believing that the things that they were reading and writing were the word of God. Right. So this podcast, we're going to dedicate to the scriptures, the writing yes. of the word of God, whereas the other one were just how they, they were moved to speak the words of God. Now, in that podcast, I mentioned a little background with somebody years ago who told me that the Bible is like eating fish. Right. You eat the meat and you spit out the bones. Yes. And I was just flabbergasted mm -hmm. when he said that to me because I don't view the scriptures like that at all. I think every single phrase, every single word yes. is important. And all of it is the word of God. And we talked about how the word of God really is like bread. It's not like fish. Yes. You can eat the whole thing oh, and just exactly dig, right. dig right into it, right? Yeah, to, and some of it, it might take a little bit longer to digest, right. and that's okay. Okay, yeah, yeah. good point. Yep. Yeah. Well, I, I recently kind of ran into the a very similar thing. I was, well, I'm into the Bible, and I'm into podcasts, surprisingly yeah. enough. That's right. And I was just looking at some other podcasts out there, and there was one called The Bible for Norm Normal People. And it has like a, a gazillion more subscribers and listeners than this podcast. And so I don't want something going on here. So, and you know, I'm a normal person, I think. Right. <laughs> and so I started to listen to it. And I, I tell you, it was really strange because I didn't agree with any of their conclusions that they were coming to. And I, I realized that I must not be a normal person. That's but, right. But you yeah. already knew that, Jay. I'm pretty sure. That's, that's right. I didn't want to mention it, but... Well, one of the guys behind this podcast, his name is Peter Enns. Yes. The last name's E-N-N-S. Okay. And I, I was just, you know, to give him, like, give, to give people their due and just, he's written several books. Yeah. So I got his first book and his first book is called, fittingly enough, Inspiration and Incarnation. Hmm. Very curious title. Yeah. You might wonder, well, what incarnation, I mean, his whole premise is that the Bible is like the Trinity. So if you follow the Trinity logic, which I don't, right. it says that Jesus is 100% God and 100% man. Yes. And he takes that analogy and applies it to the Bible right. and says it's 100% God, but it's also 100% man. Wow. And so that's how he gets around saying that it's the word of God, but then he turns around and say, oh, well, there's mistakes, there's ambiguities, contradictions. Yes. And because wow. it's it's the word of men. Well, we saw that wasn't the case in the last podcast, but we're going right. to really see that here. So it's out there in all sorts of different forms. And I even read his most latest book, thing. I'm, I'm, it's got to get better than that. The, his most latest book is called How the Bible Actually Works. Mm. And again, I my only recommendation for that book is to run the other way because right. it yes. is he really just establishes this same idea that the Bible you can kind of pick and choose and it's different now that was then and and you're not just picking and choosing little pieces of his book like you've got a good sense of <laughs> yeah. his arguments having yeah. listened to the podcasts and read his books and yeah yeah it's really interesting because if the way that the Bible speaks about itself he doesn't touch upon any of that right. So we're going to look at how the Bible actually says it works mm -hmm. from its own verses, from its own scriptures. Yes. And, and to me, if you're not going to take 
how the Bible says it works, then you're not going to believe it. You're not going to yeah. take it that way, right? So, Absolutely. But we have every confidence to believe that this is the full word of God. So right. that's why we wanted to look at this portion, just kind of consider how the Bible got written down. It's it's really, really interesting because we talked last podcast about how God spoke in various ways and at various times through the prophets and really scripture kind of is that way too. That's a, that's know? exactly right. It's it's interesting because the just as you say, the best way to go about having a look at uh, the Bible and inspiration is what it says about itself and what the writers itself understood about it. Yeah. And when we look at how it's written, I mean, scripture, scripture could be explicitly dictated in certain cases. Well, uh, I've read some people say the uh, inspiration is not dictation, but yes. that's not completely true. No, there are clear cases that inspiration is dictation. And in fact, when we look at some of the earliest examples in scripture, like you look at the book of Exodus, um, not only is it dictation, but it's being dictated by an angel of God, for mm. example. And it's described as being just, just as good as God himself. In Exodus chapter 34, you can have a look at that. And what's amazing about Exodus chapter 34 is that God gives Moses the two tables of the covenant right. again. Yeah, because he broke the first. He broke the first. Okay, yeah. So for the second time, what, what it was that God had gave him at the beginning... Moses, as he came down from the mountain, saw the children of Israel essentially revolting against God and in their hearts going back to Egypt and sacrificing to other gods. And he breaks the tablets in response to that out of anger and his zeal for God. And God says, I have to give you another two tablets. And so the word of God that was initially given to him wasn't destroyed. God says, I'm going to write it down again for you. And he gives it to him. And what you said there, I'm going to write it down for you. Like yes. in Exodus 34, verse 1, it was actually the finger of God, yeah. it says there, just writing it out. That's like, exactly that's, right. Yeah. I don't think that the angel, as it would have wrote those words, as it described as the finger of God, as angels often are in Scripture, mm. you have – that angel – wouldn't have gotten it wrong. I mean, that wasn't 100% God's words and 100% man's words. Right. This, These are God's words that are given here. Yeah. And so that the people who receive them could have confidence that these are the words of God as well yeah. as they receive that from Moses. And it happens all the way through Scripture, but another good example of this dictation is in Jeremiah chapter 36. And that's probably a good one to turn up Yeah. in uh, Jeremiah chapter 36 here. Now, I know that you're you're like me because you're into highlighting your Bible, aren't yeah. you? Oh, no, yeah. I don't have a lot of highlighting in this particular Bible, but in my King James Bible that I tend to use for study, I do have quite a bit of highlighting around the section of Jeremiah because the Word of God is one of the biggest themes that jumps out here. And some people try to destroy the Word of God in Jeremiah. And whenever you try and destroy the Word of God, the Word of God will be preserved and it comes back right. with some extra judgments against you for destroying it. And that's one of the examples we have here in Jeremiah chapter 36. God is commanding Jeremiah right here in verse 2 to take a scroll and write on it all the words that I have spoken to you against Israel and Judah and all the nations from the day I spoke to you from the days of Josiah until today. And then he says, it may be that the house of Judah will hear all the disaster that I intend to do to them, so that everyone may turn from his evil way, and that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. And so Jeremiah calls Barak, the son of Neriah, and Barak wrote on a scroll at the dictation of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord that he had spoken to him. And so right. that's how it works right here. Yeah. Jeremiah sat down, he spoke, and Barak wrote. Right. All of the words are written in a scroll. Yeah, yeah all yeah. that's they were all there. They're all preserved. Right. So there is, yeah. There's that's definitely a very good case for dictation. God speaks and they just wrote it down, right? Yeah. But that's not always the case. Like one of my favorite ones is in Revelation, where John's given this revelation and he's told to write the vision. He's just told. He says, "Write the things that you have seen." Yeah. So that's really interesting, right? Because it's just mm -hmm. like. Just tell what you're seeing, and yeah. that's what's from God. Right. So yep. you have that example. So in addition to dictation, Tim, you could also compile the words of God. And that's one of the ways that's described here in the book of Ecclesiastes. 
chapter 12. It's a really interesting way of describing how things were brought together in Scripture. Sometimes it was dictation, but here it describes the writer of the book of Ecclesiastes who is inspired by God. We believe this to be King Solomon, who was given incredible wisdom. Mm -hmm. It says in verse 9, besides being wise, the preacher, this is the writer of Ecclesiastes, it's actually what the word Ecclesiastes means, also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. So the work of inspiration and in writing down the word of God also involved the work of studying and arranging these pieces of scripture to be put together in the way that we have it today as well. That was all part of the work of inspiration. Right. Another example is how it says in the book of Proverbs that Hezekiah and his men copied out different Proverbs and assembled them together. That's Proverbs chapter 25. So mm, that was all part one. of the work of yeah. inspiration. Yeah. One of the most explicit descriptions of how the writing of scripture came about has to do with those people who were described as ministers of the word. That's an interesting phrase. Yeah, it is. And that comes out in the Gospel of Luke, right in the beginning of the Gospel of Luke at chapter 1. And so Luke wrote about the Gospels. He had perfect knowledge of these things from the very beginning. And he alludes to how it was that there were others at that time that were writing Gospel accounts as well. And Luke chapter 1, at the very beginning, he's writing to someone who he calls Theophilus. So Luke chapter 1 at verse 1, it says, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, he's speaking as the apostles here, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. And so that's Luke's introduction. These other gospel accounts are out, and he's trying to give this Theophilus an inspired account of those things, having had a perfect knowledge of these things from the very beginning. Yeah. There's that phrase, ministers of the word, which... Yep. Uh, I, we're really going to maybe have to do another podcast on that because they had a special spirit gift to preserve yeah. the word and to pass it on. And, and Luke's job is you now here just to compile those things. and Yeah, just to continue like, on that teaser a little bit because that oh, would yeah. be a really good podcast. There is a prevailing thought that the books of the New Testament, for example, just received the stamp of approval from a group of men 300 years after they were written. Yeah. And it cannot be that. You've suggested that these ministers of the word were involved in not just receiving scripture and passing it along, but also being able to determine what was right yeah. and what wasn't authentic scripture. Yeah. Luke's a historian, right? So a lot of the Bible is just history. I hear a lot of times people say, well, anybody could write history, you know, right. what's inspired about that. But when you pay careful, close attention, the way, the way it's written, mm -hmm. it's really interesting because... It puts in God's perspective right. into the history, and nobody can do that unless they're inspired That's exactly by right. God. So, I mean, for example, in Genesis 6, it says God saw that the wickedness of man was very great. Right. I mean, and then all through the kings, which is a great history of the kings and first kings and chronicles, you have God's summary of the king. He, right. would, he did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, or it would, it would tell us certain events were of the Lord, right? right? So there is inspiration in the histories as well. They couldn't write it any other way. Exactly. It was accurate just from a historical standpoint too. And it's amazing that even many people in, in the world today who are interested in history go back to the Bible to help understand what's happening during that period. I remember I was in, in university and there was a particular professor of no particular re religious bent. And we were learning about the Roman Empire. And one of the main proof texts that he used to talk about the history was the book of the Acts of the Apostles. Mm, yeah. Because just history. like Luke, there are so many moments that you can, in history, that you can triangulate to show exactly when it was taking place. And mm. he used that to help yeah. help understand. Yeah. So that's just from a natural perspective. Right. An interesting um, testament to the historical accuracy of right, scripture. Right, right. 
we have histories. I mean, we have oh, letters right. that are are in scripture, which is another interesting aspect about about inspiration. It's yes. like you're looking in somebody else's mailbox, but it's written yeah. written for us. There was actually people in the Bible who were inspired to be craftsmen, mm-hmm. uh, Basileel and Aholiab in Exodus thirty one verse six. Yeah. But not to confuse this, you know, we often talk about inspiring work of art uh, that or inspiring music. And that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the power of God to help to instruct and move somebody to do what's according to his will. Exactly. Right. That's, and that's an entirely different thing than just being a particularly gifted artist for any particular reason. Right. Right. When Bezalel and Aholiab worked, they were working according to the pattern that God had given to Moses in the Mount to do all their work, which is incredible. So this, it's a special kind of inspiration. Right, right. No matter what we have a look at in Scripture, whether it's a letter or the histories that are given or the the dictation, they all reflect the wisdom of God, and they all express who God is in different ways. And the people who receive the Word and who wrote it down in the the many ways and the different ways that are described in in Hebrews chapter 1 at verse 1, it's all expressing not the writer— Yes. But it's expressing the thoughts of God himself. Right. And that's what eventually makes it onto the page, whether it was on that piece of parchment or the tables of stone in Exodus 34, or as we understand the word today, God has inspired his word and he's preserved it throughout time. And, you know, when you think about the work of the spirit of God upon people to do this, there's a wonderful expression and a it would have inspired confidence in the apostles when they received these words from the Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 14, because this power of God to come upon people to accurately record events mm-hmm. is described in John chapter 14 in verse 26. Mm-hmm. So it says there that the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. This is the power of God being described coming upon them later on and events that they didn't understand and events that they could have forgotten during the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. It didn't matter. I can't remember what I had for breakfast. No kidding. (laughs) Yeah, that's exactly right. They would have remembered in detail the things that God wanted them to remember. And recorded it in the exact way that God would want to have it recorded. Right, right. Oh, that's a good way to put it. That's exactly, it's amazing to see that. So. yeah. And it's very explicitly said here yeah. in John chapter 14. So, yeah, you know, we talked about that in the last podcast, how the, these men spoke by the, with the word of God. So it had a power behind it. They all believed it. I mean, I was looking at how many times the phrase, it is written, it comes up in scripture. Yeah. And it's overwhelming. Yeah. Like you look up this word scripture or written is the idea behind it. And it is just all over the place. They're constantly referring back to the Word of God as an authority, right? Right. As something that is the very words of God. And one that really struck me is in Acts chapter 24 and verse 14. Now, this is the Apostle Paul before Felix. He's on trial. And this is the way that he looked at Scripture when he's describing it. And he he says to Felix, this is Acts 24, verse 14, But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets. I wanted to emphasize that everything he says Mm -hmm. that was laid down and written in the Bible of old. Like, he's not kind of picking out bones here. I was just going to say that. Yeah, <laughs> You're just exactly going to say right. that. Like, no bones. It, it's, yeah. It, yeah, no bones about it. Yeah. It's it's everything, right? So. Yeah, that, that's, a great, that's a great passage. And even, even with that, when we read a little bit later on about Paul's interaction with the leaders of the world at that particular time, they laughed at him. Yeah. For learned people would look at people like the Apostle Paul and say, you are... You're out of your mind. You're yeah. not a normal person, Paul. <laughs> right. Right? But Paul's view of inspiration was not what the people of the world would be able to willingly accept very right. easily, unless they had faith. 
unless they had reason to believe. Well, I want to have the same viewpoint as Paul. Me too. No kidding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But we're happy to be fools for Christ, as he says, right, right. In, in Corinthians, in the presence of the wisdom of the world. So that kind of brings us to our key verse. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and it, I love how it's expressed here in the ESV, especially, because oh, yeah? it, it really does justice to the, the Greek word, I think. Our key verse is 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. Yep. So, and it's interesting the way the ESV puts it. All scripture is breathed out yes. by God. Mm-hmm. Right. Do you have any inkling of the, the Greek behind that? Well, I think this doesn't require any, I mean, we're not like Greek right. scholars. We can pick up a lexicon. We can pick up a concordance and look at what it says. But that word breathes is related to the word for spirit. Right. This is essentially God enabling us to have scripture before us, his words written down, which were given by the Holy Spirit that were, was put inside men and they wrote it down. And then we're reading these things today. When we read it, it's like reading about something that comes out of God himself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We aren't to look at that if we find something that's difficult to understand or might challenge our natural thinking and say, hmm, um, I don't like that or I don't understand that. I don't think I'm going to accept that. But this part over here, no, I like this part a whole lot. Yeah. And then you start to separate what you think are the, you know, is the fish and the bone. And it just doesn't, that's not how it is that God has has recorded it. That's not how Paul, the same man who um, spoke in Acts chapter 24 that you just quoted, yeah. he believed it all. He, he believed, believed in all. the yeah. all scripture, as it says right here. Yeah. I've heard some people try to translate it. Every scripture that is inspired by God has tried to to get around to separate it. But really, that word scripture there, he also um, uses a very similar word in verse 15. Yeah. Well, let's start at verse 14. He says, As for you, continue yeah. in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you have learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings. So he's talking to Timothy, who was going to the synagogue, and that, that, those sacred writings and this scripture that Paul is talking about is none other than the, the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament yeah. that we have. The yeah. canon was was fixed at this this point, and they, yes. they knew what the scripture was. Exactly. Right? And that's what Paul is talking about. Yep. No, that's it's exactly right. And actually, when we look at all scripture here, even though Timothy would have, under the instruction of his, uh, his mom and his grandma, yeah. Lois and Eunice would have understood these things from a very early age, as Paul says. And that would have been those things in the Old Testament. But now, New Testament writings, by this time, had started to become part of what was accepted by the brothers and sisters in the first century who believed in these particular things, as we do today. And he actually speaks to Timothy about this. A really good verse to have a look at with this is actually in the first epistle to Timothy. It's in 1 Timothy chapter 5. He's always, when he's writing to to Timothy, he's quoting from so many passages in the Old Testament, even if we might not pick up on it right away. But there are times, just as you say in the New Testament, where it does say, this is what the scripture says, and thus saith the Lord. Yeah, yeah. And a couple of examples are here in 1 Timothy chapter 5. So in verse 17, just for context... He's counseling Timothy, who's taking a leadership role in the ecclesia at Ephesus. He says, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, and listen to these proofs here. What are the scriptures in the eyes of Paul speaking to Timothy? He says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. And that's a quotation from the Old Testament. Yeah. From the law. And. Interesting. He says, the laborer deserves his wages. Mm. And that's a quotation from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Yeah, if I look in my margin, that's from Luke. That's exactly yeah, right. The gospel of Luke. Yeah, this is showing how even in first century times, early in the explosion of the preaching and the understanding of the truth in the Roman Empire at that particular time, that scripture, the word of God, which was written down, was expanding to include the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and the apostles, just like was predicted by Jesus himself, where he says that the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you and bring all these things into remembrance. And here we have an example of that. Right, right. Yeah, that's really interesting. So scripture that Paul was seeing, it was including the New Testament, right? At that time, because he's quoting it and saying it's scripture, right? That's exactly right. Yeah. 
and even later on in Second Peter, where the Apostle oh, you have another Peter place is writing. Oh, there's another. Yeah, this is worth turning up, definitely. Okay. This is in Second Peter, and Peter is speaking under inspiration. He was one of those men that Jesus was speaking to in John chapter 14, who said, the Holy Spirit is going to come and inspire you to write things down, to bring all these things to remembrance. And so Peter is uh, writing about that in his epistles, about the things that the Lord Jesus Christ had taught and the things that he was continuing to teach and inspire him to write and the other apostles. Hmm. And he's actually referring in Second Peter chapter 3 to some scriptures themselves, just as we're talking about tonight. Right around verse 15, he's talking about our beloved brother Paul. Mm -hmm. And he said that the same people that Peter was writing to, Paul had also written to, according to the wisdom given him. Oh, that's interesting. Hey, where yeah. do you think that wisdom came from? Yeah, <laughs> it was given him from who? Uh, God, yeah. Yeah, this was not This was not 100% Paul yeah. and 100% God. This was 100% God right. through Paul. Through Paul. Paul yeah. said, I'm of my own self, I'm, I'm like useless. I've got nothing naturally. Right. But God speaking through him, as he did, had given him these things to write down, as he does in all his letters, it says, when he speaks in them of these matters. And this next verse really makes you feel, helps you, at least it helps me, Tim. There are some things in them that are hard to understand. Amen. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But that doesn't mean that they're incorrect. Mm -hmm. It just says that which the ignorant and unstable, they twist those words to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. Oh, isn't that interesting? Yeah. So that by saying the other scriptures, he's including Paul's writings as part of those the scriptures. Yeah. And right. Paul okay. himself said, I know that I have the Spirit of God, Yeah, he says in the book of 1 Corinthians. So he knew he was speaking through these things. And Peter... Um, Peter recognized it. He recognizes it. Yeah. yeah. It seems like some people tried to get around that passage in 2 Timothy 3 in any way they can. But to me, it's just obvious that all scripture is breathed out by God. It's inspired yeah. by God. And... To say that the Word of God somehow has errors or mistakes or past cultures that are no longer relevant, that's not what it's its all about, really. Right. its These are principles that are eternal, have been established by God himself, and therefore they're, they're true. There's a really important passage, and just an example of this is in, in John 8, verse 26, just to think about this, if these are, are really God's words, they, they have to be all truth. There's, right. there's no picking out any bones about any of it. And it's in John chapter 8 and verse 26, where Jesus says, I have much to say about you and much to judge, but he who sent me is true. Yeah. And I declare to the world what I have heard from him. That's right. So there it is again. That, that same principle we saw in the last podcast we're seeing now, that these words are, are true. There's no error in them. It's interesting. You spent a little bit of time talking about 2 Timothy 3 and about how others have tried to get around it. Yeah. But if you try and get around it in that particular way, as in any essential Bible study in all of Scripture, you can't just have one verse stand on itself. And one of the things that we've seen as we move through all these different first principles is that we don't just go to a verse to prove them. Yeah. What's the tenor of Scripture on all these verses? Right. Well, what did Paul say in other places about Scripture? You quoted in Acts 24, I believe everything written in the prophets. Yeah. yeah. So if he's not going to say to Timothy, hey, I believe that every word of God, which is Scripture, is inspired. That would not make any sense because it right. doesn't connect with what he had said before. All over the place. Yeah. So that, that consistency is a hallmark of true Bible teaching and also lets, lets us know where people get off track as well. Right, right. But I tell you what, Jay, at this point, we've been having a lot of good conversation. And I'm just going to – I'm going to say we got a lot here to go. Yeah. So let's do this in another podcast. You can stick around. Absolutely, I'll definitely stick around. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to break it off here, and but what we've seen is just how inspiration works with the scripture. We've seen it work in in many different ways. It could be di dictation, could be by visions, it could be a compilation of the the scriptures like Proverbs or Luke. It's hi history from God's perspective. It's letters. Mm -hmm. 
all of these things make up the Bible as the whole word of God. And our, right. our key verse, Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, yep. really just nails it. But when we come to the Bible, we talk about it as being inerrant, that it doesn't have any errors. And we've been trying to really prove that point. But yes. this term inerrant, without error, you hear that when inspiration is talked about, but it's not really a biblical word. So what we're going to do in the next podcast, we're going to look at how the Bible talks about itself as without error. It doesn't use the word inerrant, right. but it uses other phrases and yeah. other ways to say that. That sounds so, excellent. Yeah. Hold on. We'll be back. Thanks and we'll for the talk input. about that. Yeah. <laughs> This is a big topic for sure. If you'd like to read a book on the inspiration of the Bible, then I would recommend one called Our Sure Foundation. It's a compilation of articles from the Christadelphian magazine. I found the second part by Peter Watkins to be especially helpful. Really good stuff. So you can go to the Christadelphian magazine website at www.thechristadelphian.com and type in the search bar Our Sure Foundation and you'll find it waiting there for you. I'll leave a link in the show notes. Essential Bible Studies is brought to you by the Book Road Christadelphian Ecclesia, just up the Niagara Escarpment from the shores of Lake Ontario. Until next time, my dear friends, may God help you to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen.